UFC 305 is coming up next weekend, and today, guys, we're going to be breaking down the entire card. We're going to be talking about betting odds, my predictions. I'm going to be breaking down these fights as much as I can possibly break them down. We're going to talk about everything regarding these fights, and if you'd like to skip to any part of the video, timestamps will be there if you'd like to skip to any part. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another video. If you are new here, my name is Kyle. I am your guy with many YouTube channels, and welcome back to another full card breakdown video, everybody. With that being said, again, Timestamps are there if you'd like to skip to any part. Let's get straight into it. And guys, honestly, this card is actually really, really good. We're starting off the card with Casey O'Neill versus Luana Santos. Now, everybody probably is just excited for this fight for Luana Santos. Casey O'Neill isn't exactly, like, she doesn't really get the crowd going. But the rest of the card is actually, like, really, really, really solid in my opinion. So you have Casey O'Neill who is, there's not much to break down about her. She's a good kickboxer, but honestly, that's about it when you're taking a look at Casey O'Neill's skill set. She's coming off of two losses, and she hasn't been very active lately, and depending on how you want to look at this level of competition, like, Ariana Lipsky is getting much, much better as an opponent, so that, lodge, that loss ended up aging okay. Jennifer Maya, I feel like a lot of people look at Jennifer Maya very differently. I just think that she's kind of a big, strong girl for the division, and it's not really anything to write home about that but of course her wins are after a pretty long layoff and it's really again nothing to write home about Luana Santos on the other hand is a judo based fighter and she does a good job when she's on the ground she has nice control she has slick submissions but in my opinion that is pretty much all she has because on the feet she is pretty sloppy and honestly far from technical now if you have been following the channel you would know that while Luana Santos has a lot of people hyped up and watching this girl for a long time since her LFA days, and she's been incredibly active, nothing she's done ever really impressed me, but she looked really, really good in her last fight. But then again, the opponent is a little bit iffy. She did a good job at elevation, and she fought with high IQ, got the takedown right away. She got a really, really nice throw, found the submission. She looked like it was really, really slick, but we didn't get to see that fight really drag on, right? But regardless... She looked very, very good as having a fast turnaround, and she now has pretty much the MMA community behind her because she's been very active on TikTok. So I think this is important to take into consideration because when you have a fighter like Luana Santos, who a lot of fans want to see, a fighter who's very active on social media, and for the division, I mean, if you kind of get what I'm like alluding to over here, the judges will want this girl to win. That's entirely true. Nobody really wants Casey O'Neill to win. Everybody wants Luana Santos to win, and... It's kind of like, I know she's not Australian because they're fighting in Australia, but like, you might as well. You know what I mean? I think that's important to take into consideration because these judges have been ridiculously biased lately. If it goes to a decision, and even Casey O'Neill put on a nice striking performance, I think the judges will end up giving it to Luana Santos anyways. But, it the whole breakdown comes to this. Can Luana Santos get it to the ground? If not, Casey O'Neill is much better on the feet. She's much better on the feet. It's a kickboxer versus grappler matchup, and I think Luana Santos has a... Really, really good grappling game compared to Casey O'Neill. So can Luana Santos get a hold of Casey O'Neill and throw her to the ground? I want to say yes. I like the activity. I'm saying this with not a ton of confidence. We haven't seen Casey O'Neill in seven months. Again, she did lose Darian Lipsky, like, but, man, I don't know. I'm not high on Casey O'Neill. Luana Santos seems to be improving a little bit. I'm going to slightly lean to Luana Santos. Plus, I think the judges would definitely want her to win. And... For my, like, hopes to win the fight, I would like to see Luana Santos. It's always fun when fighters with a lot of hype get up the division, right? So let's take a look at the betting odds over here. And over on Odds Jam, you see Luana Santos is a slight favorite. That, to be honest with you, I agree with. There's really nothing else to say about that. If you want to, I'm definitely not playing her myself. I don't even know if I like Luana Santos for 1.5. I think I bet 1.5 in her last fight and lost that. But you always have to worry when you have a girl who can end up submitting people the way that Luana Santos does. So the pick is going to be Luana Santos to get the job done, but don't sleep on Casey O'Neill. Now, guys, let's continue up the card, and I am very, very excited to watch this fighter, but I'm not necessarily excited for the fight because I love watching Jack Jenkins fight. I think he has a huge potential to be one of the futures of the division, but he's taking on Herbert Burns, and Herbert Burns isn't exactly that fun to watch. So we're going to see something very exciting or something very, very lackluster. You have Jack Jenkins, who is a well-rounded fighter who does excel at Muay Thai. He has great cardio, leg kicks, calf kicks, heart takedown defense is pretty good. And he is just, like, honestly, he's a really, really good sniper on the feet. He throws every single shot at his opponents. Like, he'll never just shoot for the head. He'll hit you at all parts of your body. He has very high fight IQ in that way. And all around, he is a, like I said, all-round fighter. But he's just a very, very fun technical fighter to watch. I love watching Jack Jenkins fight, to be honest with you. On the other hand, you have Herbert Burns. Brother of Gilbert Burns, <laughs> he has BJJ, but that's about it. And even then, it's like, 
does he even have it anymore? He's 36 years old, and we've seen him coming off of three really, really rough losses. Like in the Julie Ars fight, the big takeaway from it was he just doesn't have it. He didn't want to eat shots. He couldn't get his takedowns, and he ended up getting finished. And from his lay, big layoff, he fought Nate Landwehr, Evan Dunham, and even like these opponents. I know that pe people do sleep on Bill Algio as a good opponent, but Jack Jenkins is far superior, in my opinion, to anybody that Je that Herbert Burns just took on. And Jack Jenkins was doing very, very well against Chepe Mariscal until he had the shoulder injury. And that's something that I did actually want to touch on is Jack Jenkins is coming off of a really, really bad injury. He fought 10 months ago. That's something to take into consideration if you're looking to put your money on somebody like Jack Jenkins because I don't know this. I don't know if this is publicly available. Has he been training? To what extent? And is he hesitant to throw any shots because maybe he's having some problems with the shoulder? I would imagine that he's okay if he's signed, ready for a fight, but you always have to worry about people when they're coming off of injuries. But this is probably my most confident pick on the card. I think Herbert Burns, at this point in his career, he's 36 years old, going on 37, taking on an absolute killer like Jack Jenkins and a sniper on the feet. Herbert Burns doesn't have the heart. He's going to go for the takedowns. Jack Jenkins is going to defend the takedowns, and I think Jack Jenkins is going to absolutely pick this dude apart on the feet and finish him. My pick is absolutely going to be Jack Jenkins. Let's take a look, and also I would like to see Jack Jenkins win. I love watching the dude fight, and this makes sense to be honest with you. Over on Odds Jam, you can see that Jack Jenkins is sitting at a minus 500 to 600 favorite. It makes sense, man. I really give, unless something is really wrong with Jack Jenkins and his shoulder, I, I don't see Herbert Burns winning this fight, even if it goes to the ground. I don't think, I think his jiu-jitsu is overrated to be honest with you, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, it's just... Comparing all these fighters, I, I think they're just flat out different. The pack is, pick is definitely going to be Jack Jenkins. Let's continue on up the card, though, guys, to another really, really great fight. Like, this whole card, I think I'm excited for just about every fight on here. We have Kanan Song taking on Ricky Glenn in a fight that is very important for both guys because they're both in kind of the same spot in their career, but the, the only thing is Ricky Glenn hasn't had a win since how long ago? Three years against Joaquin Silva. But I will say, we'll talk about Ricky Glenn first, and... There's not a ton of breakdown with both of these guys. Ricky Glenn is a grappler who has, like, a pretty good jab on the feet. That's about it, to be honest with you. But Ricky Glenn, he's 22-8. and eight. He's 35 years old right now. He has not looked good in a very, very long time. But the UFC fed him to some absolute killers. Take a look at all of these opponents that he fought. A lot of guys in Ricky Glenn's position would lose to the fighters that he did end up losing to. So I think that's important to note. He's not... An awful fighter like his record, his recent record is making him out the scene. But he's taking on Kanan Song. He is a really, really good kickboxer with pretty good leg kicks. He's very tough. He has good takedown defense to keep the fight on the feet. But the only issue with him is he can at times be low volume, especially at the beginning. And his striking defense does need a little bit of work. He is pretty hittable for one of the guys in the lightweight division. But the thing is, I don't know how much he'll really have to worry about that against a guy like Ricky Glenn. Like I said, Ricky Glenn's strength on the feet is pretty much just a jab. And if he wants to go for the takedowns, I would imagine that Kanan Song would be able to defend the takedowns. But then again, like both guys have been extremely inconsistent. Both guys can win. Both guys can lose. I do like Kanan Song to get the win here. I just think he'll be tougher. That's it, It's more of a gut feeling with this one because... Again, you're having a little bit of a striker versus grappler breakdown here, and I feel like Anon Song will have the takedown defense good enough to take over against Ricky Glenn. I, even if breaking this fight down and thinking like, okay, Song might have the takedown defense here, this one's a little bit more of a gut feeling to me. I don't know if you guys can relate. And to be honest with you, I don't really care who wins this fight. It sucks because I, I always feel bad for Ricky Glenn because, again, he got fed to some killers, and he never really... You know, he never got built up like a bunch of fighters do. So maybe I will cheer for Ricky Glenn. But Kanan Song, too, he's fought some really tough guys, but at least he's had some victories in the last little bit. Let's take a look what the odds are saying over here. And Song Kanan versus Ricky Glenn, you can see that Song Kanan is a minus 233 average odds favorite. I guess that makes sense. Ricky Glenn hasn't looked good, and at least we know that Song has some nice power. He can chop down the leg kicks. Like, I think he'll do an okay job. I'm convincing myself more and more that Song's going to win this fight, but... It's, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure about this one. It's going to be a fun fight. It's going to be a good fight in my opinion. All right, guys, let's continue on up the card over to Stuart Nickel taking on Jesus Aguilar. Stuart Nickel is actually somebody that I had to go take a look at because typically I'm familiar with a lot of fighters coming to the UFC, but I had no idea who this guy was. And honestly, from what I've seen, and the problem is he's taken on some opponents in a organization that isn't anything to really ride home about, but the problem is the opponents haven't looked good. 
but he looked good. <laughs> He's one of those guys coming to the UFC, and you have to kind of gauge what his skill set's going to be like coming to the UFC because he seems to be dangerous on the feet. He seems to have a complete skill set. I believe he excels on the ground. He has, from from what I've seen, he does have good entries and good ground and pound. That might be where he excels, but like, again, it's against barely any competition. That's the entire problem. I don't know how he's going to fight against a guy like Jesus Aguilar. And to break down Jesus Aguilar, we've seen him in the UFC for a little while. His only hiccup is against Tatsuro Tyra, but other than that, since the Contender Series, he's came in. He's looked pretty good, and he's had two really, really good performances, in my opinion, to be honest with you. He's a good grappler, nice submissions. He particularly has a good guillotine choke, and he's, but he he is a dangerous grappler pretty well everywhere. On the feet, he can be a little bit sloppy and wild, but he definitely isn't anybody to sleep on in that department. I don't know, like, how, here's the thing, and it's a weird matchup, because Jesus Aguilar, I still don't know where he fits in the division either. He's definitely a good fighter, but how's he going to compare to the top 10? So, He's definitely belongs outside of the top 15, right? But I have no clue where Nickel, Nickel, I keep wanting to say Nikolai for some reason, where Stuart Nickel is going to come in. This is a very, very difficult fight to break down because, again, he seems to have technique pretty well everywhere, Stuart. But Jesus Aguilar, and I'm sorry, guys, this isn't honestly a very, very good breakdown for a fight. It's really tough to break down Stuart. It's really tough to gauge, like, will his skill set be able to, it's his grappling, his grappling, his ground and pound looks great. Is it going to compare to Jesus Aguilar? I don't know. I'm going to lean on the side of no. I, I, it's a tough prediction to do, but I'm going to pick Aguilar because he did. He has that high-level experience now. He's taken on Tatsuro Tyra. He's gotten two wins over that. Looked really good. He's looked good before the Contender Series, too. I am going to pick Jesus Aguilar for that reason, the UFC experience. We still have a ton of questions about Stuart Nickel. Now, let's take a look over at what Odds Jam has to say over here and for... A fighter that I'd like to see win. I honestly, I don't really care about that. But let's take a look over at what Odds Jam is saying. And wow, okay. Stuart Nickel is a minus, over minus 200 favorite. I definitely wouldn't hit this fight at all. I don't know how it's going to work out. I don't know about you guys. If you feel any different, comment down below. Let me know. But I'm staying away from this one personally. Let's continue on up the card though to a very, very fun matchup. And that's Josh Kalibau taking on Ricardo Ramos. This is a really tough fight to break down, in my opinion. Well, not necessarily break down, but a very tough fight to predict. You have Josh Kalibo, who is a striker with very, very fast hands, good combinations, really good volume. He has a lot of heart. He won't quit when he's faced with adversity. And his only glaring weakness, and it's not even really like a glaring weakness, it's just the only real weakness that we can point out about Josh Kalibo is, at times, he can be hittable. And that's kind of the thing you need to worry about against Ricardo Ramos because Ricardo Ramos is good everywhere. He uses his range really well. He is pretty rangy and he does have very, very, very sneaky good BJJ. He's very like, when I spoke about him being rangy, he's pretty good with his kicks. He's a very underrated fighter in my opinion. And both guys are good fighters, again, in my opinion, but I think it's, they're in tough spots for their career because you have Josh Kalibau, who we've seen in the UFC for a little while now, and he's coming off of two tough losses against both Lerone Murphy and Danny Silva, and honestly, I thought that, like, okay, the Lerone Murphy fight, he got beat, but he didn't look horrible over here, the Danny Silva one was a split decision, and honestly, a really, really great fight, I thought this fight could have gone either way personally, but I'm not upset at Danny Silva getting the win over here, and Ricardo Ramos is in a little bit more of a difficult spot in his career, because he has some, like, tough losses. He's been a little bit more inactive, of course. He's losing. He lost to Charles Jordan and Julian Arosa. That's something else that's really important to note. I think that losing to both Lerone Murphy and Danny Silva are much better than losing to Julian Arosa and Charles Jordan, but it's not like you're losing to any trash cans. Like, they are very good fighters in themselves, too. It's just, there's a difference in the competition level. So, for that reason, and because Josh Klebel still has looked good in his past couple fights, Ricardo Ramos, sometimes he looks good, sometimes he doesn't, but Ricardo Ramos is more than capable of winning this fight. This one is should be a little bit closer to a pick'em in my opinion. I'm sitting kind of like 60-40 on the side of Josh Kalibo. That's going to be, yeah, that's going to be my prediction is Josh Kalibo for the video. But this is not one that you should be betting on in my opinion. I actually don't even mind taking a look at the 1.5 depending on what that is because both guys are pretty tough. It's an interesting fight, but... Very, very slight lean to Kalibo in this sense. And honestly, I would like to see Ramos win because he he's had a little bit more of a tough go lately. You know, I like both guys. So let's take a look at the uh, at Oz Jam over here. Josh Kalibo sitting at a slight favorite. 
Again, I think it should be a little bit closer to a pick em, but I'm not upset about that at all. If you want to play Josh Kleba, if you're confident in him, those are pretty good odds. And I'm interested in this one, guys, so let me know what you think about this fight down below because it's going to be an absolute banger, that's for sure. Let's continue on, though, guys, because we have another fight that's a little bit difficult to break down over here. Uh, difficult to predict, I should say, not like the last fight, okay? We have Junior Taffa taking on Walter Walker. Junior, this is a very, very quick fight to break down, to be honest, because Junior Taffa is a strong strong good really solid kickboxer but the problem is that is pretty much all he has he has good power behind his hands he can be taken down he can be controlled and recently especially in his last performance and i understand he stepped in on one day's notice but even then you gotta have those fundamentals he did nothing against leg kicks he just ate them and lost to leg kicks i don't like that some guy with a huge kickboxing background i don't know but anyways Walter Rocker is a big, strong heavyweight with decent wrestling, but that seems to be about it, to be honest with you. He also has a big problem that we've seen recently. He has less than a round's worth of cardio. That's not good. <laughs> so this is a tough fight to break down in the sense where you have Junior Taffa. Can he catch Walter Walker? We still don't know how Walter Walker's chin is. He hasn't really been cracked by a guy like Junior Taffa because the power is real. The kickboxing is real. Junior Taffa is going to be faster. He's going to be more powerful in there. But Junior Taffa can be taken down. And Walter Walker, his only really good thing is he has good wrestling. He has good takedowns. I have no clue what's going to happen in this fight, guys. I really don't. Taffa chins Walker, or Walker takes down Taffa. And even then, can Taffa survive? The Taffas aren't really that great on the ground. They kind of remind me of Mark Hunt when he hits the floor. But Walter Walker has no cardio. And it's not to say, like, Taffa has fantastic cardio either. It's not like he's, like, a super high-output guy. Ridiculously tough fight to break down. I think this is an absolute pick -em fight. I'm going to pick Taffa for the video if I have to make a pick. <sighs> like, oh, that's a tough one, guys. Tough one. I can't pick a guy who has no cardio. I can't. I can't. I'm going to pick Taffa at least in every single round. They'll start off on the feet. Maybe Walter Walker won't be able to finish him. Tough fight. And for who I'd like to see win, guys, honestly, I would like to see Junior Taffa win. I like watching the Taffa brothers. And okay, all right, Odds Jam agrees with me. Fight is basically a pick -em. This could go either way. I have no clue where it's going to go. And I think you're nuts if you're putting any money towards this fight. The pick for the video is going to be Taffa, but this should be a 50-50. Let's continue on, though, guys, up into the next fight. We have the return of Big Train Tom Nolan, and he's taken on Alex Reyes. Tom Nolan, we've seen a lot of recently. He's been pretty active. Yeah, he's been very, very active, okay? He's a tall for, tall for the division, excuse me. Heavy pressure striker. He's very accurate, very technical, but he does have one weakness, and we saw it in the Nicholas Mata fight. This dude is hittable. This dude is very, very hittable. His chin is up in the air, ready to be cracked, okay? And he also can be taken down. He has great calf kicks. He isn't afraid to be creative. He looks like he has the potential to be the real deal in the lightweight division as time goes on because he's 24 years old, vastly improving. He's looking really, really good, getting a lot of experience, being active. I like a lot what I've seen from Tom Nolan, but that defense needs to be worked on because every time we've seen him, besides his fight against, uh, where's the Bogdan fight? Yeah, the Contender Series. That's the only one that I've really seen him okay. He, you know what? He got a quick knockout. There wasn't really anything to say, but since then, chin up in the air, chin up in the air. He got the win here. He looked good, but the chin's up in the air. Alex Reyes, we all know as the brother of Dominic Reyes, he is primarily a striker, but he is a well-rounded fighter. He uses, like, the only other thing to really notice, he uses his feints pretty well. He's got power in his hands. I don't know why Alex Reyes took such a long time off, because all of a sudden, where was it? Yeah, 10 months ago, he came back against Charlie Campbell, and then before that, he almost fought seven years ago. I don't know if that was injuries. I don't know if we ever found out about that, but the rust did show in the Charlie Campbell fight. He got pieced up, he got finished, and it was it was like it was his first fight in six years. So was it ring rust? Maybe. Is it him being out of his prime? Probably. He's 38 years old fighting the lightweight division. That typically doesn't go well for a lot of people. I will say, though, like I said, guys, like Tom Nolan should win this fight, 100%. He should be better. I think he'll be better everywhere. But that chin, man, like I've been saying about Tom Aspinall, he's going to get clipped. Well, Tom Nolan has been clipped. We've seen him lose to Nicholas Mana. That could very well happen again. And Alex Reyes, he is pretty good in the pocket. He does have power in his hands. I'm just saying the potential for an upset is absolutely here. This might be the parlay buster on the entire card. But I am picking Tom Nolan to win. I think he's going to get the job done. 
And also, guys, I would like to see Alex Reyes get the win here. I, I feel so bad for the Reyes brothers, man. It was so heartwarming to see Dominic Reyes get the win here. And oh my god. Tom Nolan is a minus 1,100 favorite at average? Almost 1,200? That's crazy. That is absolutely insane. If any of you are putting this in your parlays, you're crazy. Absolutely crazy. That is not worth the risk. One little bit. Wow, I did not expect it to be that bad. I thought it was going to be like a minus five, six hundred. Holy, that's crazy. That's crazy. This one is, this one is prime for an upset, boys. Good time for a little bit of a pause on the video, guys. If you don't want to hear me yap, just skip about a minute. But anyways, I now have my little one and my dog with me right now because I told my wife that she can go hang out with her cousins and I would watch a baby and I still need to record this video. Got home a little bit late from work today, so might have a few jump cuts depending on what they end up doing over here. My dog's already digging on the couch, Sonny. <laughs> yeah, see, here's one. So yeah, that might be the only issue, but I will cut these things appropriately. Apologies for that, but guys, to put a little bit of a pause on the video, as you might know, or as you definitely know if you've been following the channel, I talk a lot about betting on this channel. If you guys are interested in either supporting the channel or seeing where I'm putting my money where my mouth is, if you want to combine your research with my MMA knowledge, you're more than welcome to check out the channel membership. It is in the pinned comment description down below or right next to the subscribe button. It is very cheap com compared to other channels, and every single Thursday or Friday, I'll be making a members-only video and a community members post talking about all of the bets that I will be placing for MMA each weekend again on Thursday or Friday. Also, this website that we've been using, Odds Jam, if you guys would like to try out Odds Jam, it's fantastic for people with different sports books, and it's a great tool in general to gauge where you can find the best odds. It has a bunch of tools on the site. If you want to sign up to Odds Jam, you can get a discount using my link in the pinned comment description down below and code CLENBAT. You can get a discount over at Odds Jam. Thank you very much to Odds Jam. Thank you for listening to me. Let's get into the main card. All right, guys, let's move on to the main card. The first fight on the main card, which I didn't change yet, is <laughs> Mateusz Gamrot taking on Dan Hooker. If you guys don't know, I'm a very, very big fan of Mateusz Gamrot. And shockingly, I'm not the big fan of Dan Hooker. Like, and it's not like to say I dislike Dan Hooker, but I'm just like, he's not one of my big fan favorites like so many fighters are. It's just, I Dan Hooker's there. I enjoy watching his fights, I appreciate his talent, and I just don't necessarily care about him. But everybody does like Scamrot, I'm a huge fan of Gamrot, so I always found that very strange. But anyways, you have Mateusz Gamrot, who I am convinced one day will be a UFC champion. He is a very, very well-rounded fighter, but the goal is always to grapple. He's incredible control, transitions, submission threats. On the feet, he is incredibly sneaky, and I will say that he is very underrated. He, very, he fights very safe, does a good job at uh, sticking to game plans. Recently, though... One thing to note when breaking down a fight with Mateusz Gamrot is we saw in the Rafael DeSanjos fight, shockingly against DeSanjos of all people, we saw him get rocked for the first time like really, really bad. It's important to note that after he got rocked, he was extremely hesitant for the rest of the fight. If that happens again, that's something that's very important to note. On the other side of the coin though, you have Dan Hooker who is an incredibly tough and durable kickboxer when he's on. He uses his range well and can be very technical, but sometimes he does get himself sucked in to brawls, wars, and Dan Hooker's in an interesting spot in his division in this in his career. Excuse me, because everybody thought that he was past his prime. He took too much damage. I thought the same thing as well, to be honest with you, especially when he lost to Islam Makachev and Arnold Allen. But then he looked okay against Claudio Puelles, but it was a little bit of a safe fight. And then he went to a war with Jalen Turner. He went to war with him. He looked fantastic in that fight, and it was the Dan Hooker of old. So as of right now, I know Dan Hooker's coming off of, I believe it was an arm break, and that's something important to note. It was just a year ago. How's the training been going? Is the arm going to be the same? Is he going to be hesitant? Knowing Dan Hooker, I imagine that we're okay. I imagine that he'll tough it out either way. He's just one of those guys. But Dan Hooker, also another thing important to note about him is, of course, we all know he is better than his record. He has been fed to the dogs of the lightweight division. He's 23 and 12. That makes total sense to have a record like that, okay? There has been something going around, and I am I personally don't know what to think, okay? A lot of people think that Dan Hooker and Israel Asanya have started juicing. People have been thinking that Israel Asanya has been juicing for a very long time. The city kickboxing story, if that's coming through the mic. My baby just learned how to spit, <laughs> and she's been doing it. <laughs> I don't know if it's coming through the mic. My apologies, my apologies if that's annoying, guys. Let me know in the comments down below, please, if this is something that you'd like, to me, like me to leave out, because it honestly is very, very 
Um, it's very convenient for me to record right now, so I would appreciate, like, honestly, I'm always looking for criticism on the channel. If this is something that you just flat out don't want to see my side comments about my baby, just let me know, and I'll make sure I record at a different time, okay? But anyways, guys, as I was saying, a lot of people are thinking that Dan Hooker is juicing. There have been some pictures coming out of him where he's looking incredible. The dude's in shape. The dude seems ready to fight. That's something that's important to take into consideration because there does seem to be something going on at City Kickboxing. I don't know. Like, it's just, it, it could be true. That's kind of where I'm sitting on over here. Anyways, breaking down this fight, guys, I think Mateusz Gamrot is going to win this fight. Absolutely. I don't think that Dan Hooker is going to catch him. Maybe he could catch him with a knee. Maybe he could catch him with a hook, counter him somehow. But I think Mateusz Gamrot has the chin, the cardio, the heart to get past whatever Dan Hooker is uh, whatever could happen with Dan Hooker or any adversity that Dan Hooker could throw Mateusz Gamrot's way. I think Gamrot is all over this fight. I think he's a fantastic fighter. I think he's incredibly underrated. And a lot of people really discredit a lot of what Gamrot has done throughout his career because he has the mythic Gamrot type thing where he just injures his opponents. But in reality, he's an amazing fighter. I will forever say his fight against Armin Sarukian. I don't know where it is. Yeah, Armin Sarukian was one of the most high-level fights we have ever seen in the UFC. It was one of the best fights I've ever seen. And it's been nothing but, of course, like that weird loss to Benil Dariush. Very strange for Dick Hamrot. But anyways, since then, it's been really, really great performances in my opinion. So I'm all over Mateusz Gamrot. I, you might call me crazy for this one, but I think he's on track to become champion one day. I think he trains with great guys. I like what I've seen from him. And I think that Mateusz Gamrot is going to win the fight. And I would also like to see Gamrot get the win over here. I'm a big fan of Gamrot. And I would, I'm, always, I'm always cheering for him. So interestingly enough... I thought Gamrot would be a little bit more of a favorite than he is, but it does make sense. Dan Hooker's very dangerous. Dan Hooker could very well drag Mateusz Gamrot into a war, come out on top there. We did see Gamrot get rocked in his last fight. Maybe that has something to do with it, but regardless, I do like Gamrot a lot. That's a little bit steep. I, I'm one of those guys, I don't necessarily like to do parlays, so... Gamrot might be one that I just skipped this time around, to be honest with you, but I am confident in him getting the job done. All right, guys, let's continue on to one of the featured fights over here. I'm very excited for this fight, guys. We have the return of the leech, Li Jing Liang, and I, he's taking on, and I apologize, guys. I never know the proper pronunciation. It's either Carlos Prates or Carlos Prats. I don't know which it is. My apologies, but we'll start with Carlos Prates because... I am very, very impressed with this dude, and it's shocking to me that you see a guy come onto the scene that's so impressive, and he's 19-6. and six. Like, the record's not great, but man, has he been looking good. He is a very, very dangerous and powerful striker with a very, very versatile variety of attacks when it comes to kicks. He's uniquely light on his feet. He uses his lead leg like a jab, and it's very, very unique. You can never count him out of a fight. He's always present, and this dude, <laughs> he does smoke cigarettes. I have heard that around a lot. That's going to catch up to him one day, but he is still young. He's 31 years old. He's in his prime, and he's taken on the leech, Li Jing Liang, who's been out of the cage for almost two years now. As far as I know, nobody knows where he went or why he's been gone, if he's been training. Not a clue, but other than that, he's a very good kickboxer, good power, solid fundamentals. He is Always one of those fighters, like Carlos Prates, like I was just talking about, you can never count him out of a fight. He has great body shots, straight shots, counters, leg kicks. Again, the fundamentals, he's pretty, pretty good on the feet, but sometimes, like, the only weakness in his game is he can drop his hands, and that's something that I don't think that you should be really doing against Carlos Prates, because I've been very impressed from his UFC run so far, and I've been watching him before the UFC as well. Like, I've been watching this guy for a very, very long time. He got a great KO on the Contender Series. The UFC, he's had to... Really, really nice wins. I understand in the Trevin Giles fights, he he was getting pieced up, but I think in that that fight, he did show that he can overcome ver he can overcome adversity in his fights, and he can still win. And it's not like he got a fluke KO. He set that thing up. He looked so good. Li Jing Liang, on the other hand, though, unfortunately, he's 36 years old, 19 and 8. He's won one. He's lost one. It's been a really, really tough go for him, to be honest with you. And the Daniel Rodriguez fight, I understand, was a was a very controversial fight. I also thought that Li Jing Liang won. He should be on a two-fight win streak over here. I thought that was an absolute robbery. But, guys, I'm feeling so good about Carlos Prates. And I, I don't know how far he's going to make it up the division. But as of right now, I think he's going to beat the guys at the kind of rank where the leech is in the division. He's going to have a reach advantage. He's going to be very good at using it. I think he's going to be able to keep Li Jing Liang on the outside of a variety of attacks. I think that he's going to, he's going to be too creative. He's going to be working the body. He's going to be using that league leg like a jab that he always does. And I don't think it helps, too, that Li Jing Liang is 36 years old now, past 36 years old, and he hasn't been in the cage in almost two years. I think that's something very, very important to note. 
And I think that Carlos Prates is going to win this fight. I'm fairly confident saying so. But if somebody's going to upset, I think it's going to be Li Jing Liang. And honestly, guys, I would like to see Li Jing, Li Jing Liang get the win over here. Been a big fan of his for a very long time. But I also like watching the Nightmare fight a lot. Let's take a look at what Odds Jim has to say about this fight. Carlos Prates sitting at a minus 229-ish favorite. That's understandable. The activity, the performances have been there. Li Jing Liang, we haven't seen the same thing. So... Again, the odds make sense for that one, and I am going to be picking Carlos Prates myself to get the win in this bout. All right, guys, let's continue up the card to the actual featured fight. We have the return of Tai Tuivasa, and he's taking on Jarzinho Rosenstruck. Tai Tuivasa has been on a little bit of a skid, 14-7. and seven. He put together a few wins before this big losing streak, and everybody was talking like, hey, Tai Tuivasa's putting it together. He's looking better and better, but unfortunately, he lost to Cyril Gaon. He lost to Sergei Pavlovich, he lost to Alexander Volkov, and he lost to Marcin Tybura. Now, these three bouts, okay, they're respectable losses. Marcin Tybura is also a respectable loss, but losing the way he lost to Tybura shows that Tai Tuivasa is clearly on the decline. We don't know if he has it anymore. He's taken a lot of damage in his career. The thing is, he's 31 years old, so can he bounce back? He's always live in a fight. I don't know if that's coming through the mic. My apologies. <laughs> I'll do a jump cut if it continues, but... Like I said, man, he always has the power to remain in a fight, so it's a little bit tough to say whether or not Tai Tuivasa is washed. Jarzinho Rosenstrike on the on the other side of the coin. There's not a lot to break down with either of these guys. He's a good striker for the division, low volume. He can pick his shots, and he hits really hard. Did I say anything about Tai Tuivasa? He's a big guy with huge power, good speed. <laughs> very, very easy fight to break down, to be honest with you. Guys, there's not a ton to say over here. Jarzinho Rosenstrike, at least he's coming off a really good performance against Shamil Gaziev. He's lost to Jelton Almeida, Alexander Volkov, Chris Blaze, but he lost at the top of the division. He beat Chris Dawkins, and I think that Jarzino Rosenstruck just beats Tai Tuivasa. I don't think Tuivasa is going to chin him. I do think that Tai Tuivasa might be done. He's taking a lot of damage. The heart's not there. I don't know if the dude works out. At least Jarzino Rosenstruck is coming up of a piecing up performance of Shamil Gaziev, and he might just do the same thing to Tai Tuivasa. I think it's going to be a striking match, and I think Rosenstruck is just going to outstrike him. There's not a ton to break down here. I'm going to pick Jarzinho Rosenstrike to get the win over here. But Tai Tuivasa is, of course, always live for a KO. The dude has really, really big power. And you can see that Jarzinho Rosenstrike is a, is a small favorite to get the win over here. It's a heavyweight fight. Two guys with really big power. Anything can happen. The odds make sense to me. And I forgot to say who I would prefer to win this fight. I actually really, really like Tai Tuivasa. I would love to see him get the win. And I don't know if it's his hometown, but they're fighting in Australia. They'll definitely be cheering for him. And... I would love to see him get on the cage, do a shoey with some people. Tai Tuivasa is always really fun. I can't wait. And it'd be sad to see him like lose so much that he gets cut from the UFC. So I'm definitely going to root for Tai Tuivasa to get the win here. But the pick is going to be Jarzinho Rosenstrike. All right, guys. Let's move on to the co-main event. Kai Car France taking on Steve Urseg. Wow. Everybody is high on Steve Urseg right now. I'll start with Kai Car France. We haven't seen him in a little while. I believe he's been off with an injury. Not 100% on that, but I believe he's been off with an injury. That's something to take into consideration. A lot of people, too, thought this year Amir al his last fight was a robbery. I thought it was close enough to not complain. I, would, I haven't watched it since. To be honest, I didn't want to watch it since. It wasn't like a barn burner or anything like that, but I thought that it was an okay decision. I didn't think it was a robbery or anything, but of course, he did lose to Brandon Moreno. Didn't look good there. He, dude has been very, very inactive compared to Steve Ursaig. Steve Ursaig has been fighting a million times. Coming off of one of the best performances of his career, and it was a robbery. Steve Urseg should have absolutely won this fight. Steve Urseg is the flyweight champion as far as I'm concerned. So, to break it down, you have Kaikara France, who's a great, fast striker with really good takedown defense. And Steve Urseg, on the other hand, I have a lot more to say. He's a very, very complete all-round fighter. He is He can do anything. The dude can pretty well do anything, except, like, maybe a brawl can give Steve Urseg issues. But he is technical everywhere. He has a good chin. He has good cardio. He literally... He has everything, okay? Little bit of fight IQ mistakes against Pantoja, but he's so new to his career and took on the champion. One of the best champions in flyweight history, depending on how you look at Pantoja. I think he's a fantastic fighter. He can do everything. So he, I, if he wants, he can grapple Kaikara France, but even on the feet, guys, I think that Steve Ursaig's better. I really do. I've been impressed with every single one of Steve Ursaig's fights. Ever since he came into the UFC, he's looked good. And especially, I'm very high on Alessandro Costa. Beating him the way he did looked great, in my opinion. He beat Pantoja. Kai Car France, on the other hand, has been very inactive, and his wins are not nearly as good as Steve Urseg's win, in my opinion. I think that Steve Urseg clears Kai Car France. 
I think he's still improving. He's going to have that hunger. He now has the fans who want him to win. He Everybody's cheering for Astro Boy at this point. He's become a fan favorite. Who's going to actually cheer for him in the crowd? I don't know who they're going to really go with. Interesting. But either way, either way, I, I just, I, I think Steve Ursaig's better. That's it. There's not a ton to break down here. I'm picking Steve Ursaig to get the win. I think no matter where the fight goes, Steve Ursaig will be better. That's my breakdown. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Not a ton to talk about there. I'm picking Steve Ursaig to get the win, and I want Steve Ursaig to get the win. Kai Car France is a little cringe, to be honest with you, but I like Steve Ursaig, man. And Steve Ursaig is the favorite. They're seeing what I'm seeing. Kai Car France does have big, big power for the division. Well, it's he, he can piece you up. He can get the knockout. I wouldn't say big power. Let me walk that back a little bit. I'm just saying he could upset. It's possible. It's possible. But I'm honestly like a 90-10 over for Steve Ursaig. I'm very confident to get the job done. And I would like to see him get the job done, to be honest with you. All over Steve Ursaig. No bias. I like the dude. But I hope you guys know that by now when breaking down these fights. I don't bet with my heart. I pick with as much knowledge as I can possibly bring. And I like the Li Jing Liang. I think he's going to lose, but I'm hoping for him to win. So I hope you guys don't see that that way. But either way, man, I'm all over Steve Ursaig. Let's move on to the main event of the evening. We have Drickius Duplessis taking on Israel Adesanya. I'll talk about the elephant in the room. I rewatched the Sean Strickland fight. Initially, I was kind of like, since I've watched it, I was always like, eh, that fight could have gone either way. I'm not mad at Drickus Duplessis getting the win over there, but I rewatched it. I am a little bit more confident that Sean Strickland got the win, but I still think it was close enough to really not care. It's definitely not close enough where Sean Strickland would be like, give me a title fight. <laughs> like, Robert Whitaker is gonna get is gonna pass him up on that. But anyways, Drakus Duplessis is a well-rounded fighter with big power and really, really good strength. The dude is strong for the division. He's very wild, very unorthodox, but he seems to always make it work. He has success when he's blitzing, he hits you with huge shots. He is the weirdest fighter to break down because he always looks like he's gassing out. He's always looking like he doesn't know how to fight. But he puts it together, and he always gets the job done. The dude is 21-2, and two, and he's had a clear road through the UFC so far. He even beat Robert Whitaker, man, by TKO. Crazy. The dude is deserving of champion to be champion, in my opinion. Don't talk to me about the, you have to beat the champion to beat the champion. I thought it was close enough to not care. I personally gave it to Sean Strickland, but, again, close enough. Israel Adesanya, on the other hand. 35 years old, something very important to take into consideration. He's a very, we all know him now. He's a very technical and lengthy kickboxer with very good movement. He's very elusive. He picks his shots well. He typically fights pretty safe. And contender is he specifically has power in his hands. Like a lot of people were talking about Dan Hooker, the city kickboxing juicing. It was around Asanya has been growing his boob again. I think that's something very important to note, to be honest with you, because Israel Asanya, when he grows a boob, he has that Costa type power. He knocks out Alex Pereira. Contender Izzy is a different Izzy, comes out more aggressive, comes out to really, really take your head off, okay? Israel Adesanya, his last two losses were both to Alex Pereira and Sean Strickland. He's coming off of a loss 10 months ago where he got completely outclassed. I think something else that's important to take into consideration is that Israel Adesanya may be out of his prime at this point. 35 years old, you're typically out of your prime. Maybe, maybe that's why he looked the way he did against Sean Strickland, but I don't want to take any, anything away from Sean Strickland. He did a great job at crowding out Asanya the entire time, making him uncomfortable. Maybe that's a new game plan to beat Israel Asanya and Drakus Duplessis. He could absolutely take advantage of that. He can rush forward with his giant shot, trying to grapple with Izzy. Like, the game plan might be there, and Israel Asanya might be out of his prime at this point. Israel Adesanya lost a lot of aura after his last fight. And I think that's honestly really, really important because sometimes people fight very timid against Adesanya and understandably so. If you were to, like, this is so tough because when looking at this on paper, and if I were to, if you were to ask me about this maybe even two years ago, I would have said Adesanya walks through Duplessis. Duplessis is too wild. He's too weird with his shots. His mouth is always open. Israel Adesanya is going to piece his way to a victory. But Drakus Duplessis makes it work every time. He's big, he's strong, he walks forward, and he could very well crowd Adesanya the way that Sean Strickland was crowding Israel Adesanya, just the defense might not be the same. But then again, Drakus Duplessis, what he will bring that Sean Strickland didn't is a heavy, strengthy grappling game. I, I'm actually leaning towards Duplessis, guys, to get the win over here. But then again, contender is he, juiced up is he, titty is he, might come back, and he might just absolutely floor Duplessis. Maybe. I don't know what to think about this one. I'm kind of at like 
60-40 for Drickus Duplessis. Maybe 65-35. It's a very, very tough fight and a very close fight to pick. I think I honestly think that Israel Adesanya is the better fighter. I do. But I think that Drickus Duplessis plus is Israel Adesanya. I don't know, man. Like, sometimes I worry about Israel Adesanya's confidence. But then I think about, like, okay, he's more delusional than not confident. If everybody's making fun of him at the press conference, everybody's making fun of him against Sean Strickland. Like, I don't know if that's anything really worth taking into consideration because I don't really know if it affected his performance at the end of the day, but I'm my gut's telling me Drick is 2 plus C in this one. My gut's also telling me to not bet on this one, and that's definitely what I'm not going to be doing. So I'm going to slightly lean towards Drick is 2 plus C to get the win over here. I think the era of the style bender is over, but then again, contender is he might just show up with a boob and just flat out destroy Drick is 2 plus C. So who knows, man? For who I would like to see win, I'm a fan of Duplessis. I like Duplessis. I'm going to cheer for Duplessis to get the win. I would like to see him continue his run as a champion. I would like to see the rematch with Sean Strickland and Robert Whitaker both. The odds have Israel Adesanya at a slight favorite. I get that. Nothing to really ride home about over there. So right now, actually, what's interesting is we have an over-under for 3.5. Eh, I don't like that one either. Contender as he worries me. Contender as he worries me a lot. But I don't hate that. I'm not going to be betting on it myself. Let me know what you thought about all of the fights down below, guys. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for watching. I appreciate your time. Apologies if my little one over here who's yawning now, she needs to eat now. I'm going to stop the recording and do a feeder. But uh, I'm going to put a video over top of it right now. If you guys would like to continue watching the channel, YouTube thinks you like this video the best, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Take care.